All right. So last week in the evening, I preached a sermon about how to serve God, you know, for, for women. If you're a woman, you want to serve God. So tonight I'm going to be preaching a sermon for the men. And um, eventually, whether next week or, or another week, I'm going to be teaching a sermon for children as well. And um, what I did last week and what I'll be doing again this week, we're focusing more on the verses that deal with specifically with men and women, whether it be men and women in general or husbands and wives. You know, we're going over these. And look, I know we've covered these topics recently and in other sermons. We've gone over a lot of this subject before in the past, but I think it's really important in the days that we live in because a lot of this has to do with the family. It has to do with the way that God has designed this. And we really need to make sure that we are in line with what the Bible says. Because when I specifically mention men and women, there are many things that we should be doing to serve God that everybody should be doing. It's not specific to men. It's not specific to women. It's not specific to children. You know, soul winning, for example, coming to church, reading your Bible, praying, all of these great things to serve God, to do what you should be doing in your life for God are all encompassing. Regardless of gender, regardless of, of age, you know, all of these different things. So what we're doing is looking at serving God and, and looking at the, the scriptures that apply specifically. Now you can be married, unmarried, doesn't matter as we look at these scriptures. And a lot of these um, for men, we're going to be looking at, you know, I know there's women here tonight, but um, there's still a lot to, to be gleaned from this stuff, even as you're a woman. And there's a lot of attributes that even if you're a woman, there's still good attributes to have. Okay, now... Some of them are not going to be good for women to have. Some of them are specifically, very, very specifically for the men. You know, the leadership roles and some of those other things. We look at the scripture. Those are definitely geared towards men. But some of these, you know, the first verse we're looking at is verse number two in Titus chapter two. This is, it's the Bible says that the aged men, so this is talking about older men, right? Older men in the church. This is what they need to be taught, that they be sober. Now, sober is one attribute that could be applied to men and women, but this is a teaching specifically for, for men here. We see in other, in other scriptures that, that women are taught to be sober also. But um, here that, that aged men be sober, grave. Now those two words are almost identical, right? Being sober and being grave is being serious. Being able to have a level of, of seriousness to where not everything's just a joke. You're not just real flipping about everything and just nothing's a big deal. When you're sober, you're serious about something. When you're grave, you're also serious, right? It's a, it's a solemn event when somebody is put into the grave. And that's what the, why this word, you know, is, is associated with, with death. When somebody dies, it's a very grave matter. People aren't just joking and laughing and, you know, throwing a big party. Typically, it's a, it's a sad event you know, the, the loss of a loved one, and it's a serious event. It's a, it's a solemn event. So to be sober and grave, you know, we need to be serious. And the aged men, the older men, definitely need to have that level of seriousness. After, after you've gone through being a child and being a young adult, you know, at some point you got to grow up. And you got to be serious. And it's, and it's a shame when you see this old men that just, they just never grow up at all. And I'm not saying you can't have fun. I'm not saying, you know, that that's a sin. But you need to also be able to be sober and to be grave. Temperate. Being able to control yourself. And that's in all things, whether it be with anger, sadness, whatever it is, being temperate is being able to be in control under all kinds of different conditions. No matter what is being thrown your way, if you're temperate, you are controlling yourself. Sound in faith. Um, again, we need, to, we need to know what we believe. If you're sound in your faith, you're not going to be easily shaken. Someone's not going to come up to you and say, but look at this verse. It says you could lose your salvation. You're going to be like, oh man, I never saw that before. Right? If you're sound in your faith, you are going to be uh, grounded. You're founded. You know what you believe and you know why you believe it. It's not just good enough to know what you believe, but to know why you believe it. And that's why we cover so much scripture in the sermons is because I don't want you just to believe the words that come out of my mouth and just say, oh, I believe this because Pastor Burson said so. No, you ought to be able to say, oh, I believe this because the Bible says this and you can turn to it for yourself and show the support for it and be sound in your faith. In charity, of course, we went over all about charity on Wednesday night's sermon in 1 Corinthians 13 about that having that love and caring for other people. We put other people above yourself. And then in patience, 
being able to endure things. These are all attributes that are supposed to be taught to the aged men. So for men, these are all things that apply for you. Verse number six, let's jump down to verse number six. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. So, you know, as the aged men were told to be sober, to be grave. Hey, young men, it's also for you too. You don't get a pass just because you're a young man. You ought to be able to show times where you're serious, where you can be um, taking things seriously, and not everything is just one big joke. Verse 7, In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. So young men, you need to be able to show yourself as a pattern of good works. You ought to be an example to other people. The good works that you do, you ought to have enough good works in your life and in your day-to-day -day work, in your day-to-day -day business, whatever it is, um, and especially with serving God, to be able to say, hey, so young Christian, babe in Christ, you can look to me as an example. I'm somebody that you can follow because I have a good example. I have a pattern of good works. It's something that's a, a normal part of my routine to be in the pattern of doing good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness. Again, this is showing that you have knowledge of the Scripture, of doctrine, of what you believe, that you're showing uncorruptness. What is uncorruptness? It's not defiled. It's not, it doesn't have errors. It doesn't have problems. It fits well with the whole Bible. You're not believing in some weird doctrines that are contradicted in other parts of the Bible. Because as soon as you find contradictions in what you believe, you, you, you've been corrupted. You have um, corruptness in your doctrine. So you need to be able to reconcile everything that you believe with all of the Scripture. It needs to be able to fit perfectly in place. You ought not to be able to have areas where your doctrine and what you believe can just be completely proven wrong through other scriptures in the Bible, which means you have to have a good knowledge of the Bible. God expects you to have this knowledge. Gravity. Again, just like being sober-minded, being grave, having that gravity. The, old men, the aged men as well as the young men need that same attribute. Sincerity. Right? It's, it's true from your heart. You're not, you're not faking it. You're sincere in your belief. You're sincere in what you believe, and it just comes through. It's actually in your heart. It's not just lip service. It's not just something that you know the answer to, and you'll say the right things, but it's not actually in your heart. These are things that you say and you actually believe. Too many people go to church, and they know what the right answers are, and they know what people want to hear, and they know what people expect them to look like, and they'll go and play the charade, and they'll play the little church game, and they'll go and, and, and show up, They'll do their thing and then they'll go home, but it's not really in their heart. God says, I want you to be sincere. This needs to be from your heart. Otherwise, you're just going through motions. Then, and otherwise, it's just being something that's religious for you as opposed to something that you truly believe. Let's look at our next verse. Verse number eight. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. Young men, this is an important one to have sound speech. What you say ought not to be things that people can condemn you for. We need to be very careful. And I preached on this a few weeks ago about the, you know, the tongue. The Bible says is, is unruly. right? It's, it's, it's the small member of your mouth, but a, a, you know, a little fire uh, can, can cause a great matter, to, you know, a, a big... Flame comes just from a small spark, just from a small fire, kindles a great matter. And our tongue and our speech can get us in a lot of trouble. And we need to be very careful that we say what we mean and we mean what we say. And we're not just saying things flippantly, you know, that we could retain that filter of knowing when to speak and when not to speak. You know, if you're using sound speech, you know when things are appropriate to say. You know if someone's antagonizing you and just trying to get a response out of you. If you just snap and respond right away, you're probably not going to say what you really ought to say. You're probably not going to have that sound speech. You're going to be acting too hasty and maybe allowing some of your emotions to get involved and you're going to be saying things that you really are going to regret later or that someone else will be able to hear you say and say, you know, condemn you for what you've said. And rightfully so, because you didn't have that proper filter, because you're not making sure that you have sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you. And see, this is when people know that you're a Christian. When you have 
the pattern of good works. When you have uncorruptness in your doctrine and people start to see that and they see that way of life, they're going to have you pegged, this is a Christian, and they're going to be thinking in their mind, which people normally do, even if you're not like this at all, oh, there's that Christian. He thinks he's so much better than everyone else. People have a tendency to just think that way, oftentimes because they just see the way that you live your life. Even if you're not like that at all, you're just trying to live your life and do what's right by God. People will look at that because they feel guilty and convicted of their own sins. They see you doing what's right. You know, people, this happens with me and my wife all the time. They'll see how I dress, how she dresses, that we don't do certain things. And, and what, whatever the case may be, it's usually something really little and, and, and kind of stupid for other people to be getting so irritated about with the way that we live our life. And we're not just there cramming down people's throats and, oh man, I can't believe that you're wearing pants or what, you know, whatever the matter is. It's not like we're just, you know, going after other people. But their perception of us, and it's just because we're doing this, you know, we, we do what we're trying to do. We, we, you know, we preach the word. We preach salvation to those that need it. But we don't just go into all, kind, all kinds of other doctrine with people who are unsaved. And, um, you know, we don't think that we're better than anyone else. We don't think that we're just better than these other people or other family members. It's just that we're trying to live a certain way. But see, the world will look at you and think that way. Very often times, they'll, they'll have that type of an attitude. And oftentimes, they'll be looking at, well, how can I, you know, bring him down a notch? I don't like that he's doing this and doing that. So they're going to be looking to be able to find some evil against you. So that's why he says here to have sound speech. So you'll be able to control what comes out of your mouth. Because people will provoke you. They did it to Jesus. Remember, they, they came to Jesus tempting him. And they would bring up these scenarios where they brought the woman taken in adultery and they were doing all these things to try to trap him in his words, in his speech. They, they were continually trying to do this because they were trying to find a reason to arrest him. Remember also the people that hated Daniel. Daniel was living righteously. Daniel served God. He prayed three times a day. He was doing everything that, that, that was right and, and they were so angry because they couldn't find any reason to accuse him. He was doing his job well. They couldn't accuse him for, you know, for flaking off and not doing his job. They couldn't find anything that he was saying to accuse him of, so they had to find a way, of course, through his religion, through believing in God and, and treating God's commandments higher than any other commandment um, to, to get him in trouble that way. And honestly, that's the way that we ought to be is that if we're going to be condemned for anything, we should be condemned for our righteous living and not for something that we do or say that would rightfully be condemned. That would be, yeah, you know, you screwed up, you did wrong, you, you know, it's not, you don't have a, a leg to stand on. So he's saying here, we need to make sure that you watch your speech, have sound speech that cannot be condemned. Verse number nine, exhort servants to be obedient under their own masters. Now, I'm going to cover these verses too. It's talking about a servant and a master relationship, which we have that if you have a boss. You know, a servant does not mean a slave. It does not mean you're necessarily an indentured servant, that you are forced into something. You can be a servant to someone and they could be your master in this type of language the same way that we can view a boss and an employee. So, since men's job is going to be providing for the family, we'll get into some of those verses a little bit later, but we're in the passage now of Titus 2, so we'll go over this now. Oftentimes, men are servants. You have an employer, you have a boss, and the Bible says here, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. He's saying, obey your boss. Do what he says. Don't think that just because, oh, I've got a better way of doing things. And look, this goes for anybody under obedience. Just because you think you have a better way of doing things, it is not right to contradict your authority, to just go against what they have said. And men, you have bosses, they tell you to do something. I don't care if your way is way better. If he tells you to do something, you ought to be obedient unto their own masters. It says, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not talking back to the boss. Right, saying, oh man, but if you, you know, that way is so stupid or whatever, and, and just going off on whatever your boss just told you to do. Now, being a servant and being in obedience to somebody else requires humility. 
It requires humility. And this is something I hope everybody can take this, that this isn't just for the men. Now, in this application, it's for the men with their masters, with their bosses, if you have one. But anybody who is to be obedient to another person needs to take heed to this, that we are all obedient unto, our, unto the person who has our authority and please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity. What's a fidelity? It's being faithfulness, right? You're being faithful to what they say. And you just do, okay, boss, this is a job you got for me to do. Yes, sir, I'm going to do it. You don't answer them again. You don't question them. You don't back talk. You just do it. You are hired, you are employed by your boss to do a specific job, to work for him. He pays you money for your work. And you are employed to do his business, to do his bidding. That's what you sign up for. You know, I'll be like, oh, that's not in my job description. I'll say, look, if your boss is telling you to do it, it's in your job description. It's what you're supposed to be doing. Amen. That shows a lack of humility when you say, I, I'm not going to do that. And this, this has come up even in my own, in my own workplace. Now, there's ways of entreating your boss and trying to explain your ways. You know, you could, especially depending on the dynamic and what your boss is like, you should be able to, to, to bring concerns up to them and, and, and tactfully and politely and respectfully be able to address something that maybe you think would be a benefit and he'd want to hear and, and an alternative to doing something different. But we need to maintain that level of respect for the authority that your boss has over you and for you being a servant and being a very good servant to that. We had, we had an issue, it's kind of silly and really stupid, but I work in an office and there's all kinds of stupid office politics are always going on. And of course, nobody really likes the IT guys because we're weird and, and not very sociable and whatever, whatever the reasons are. And, um, but of course, it's a small business, so like, it comes up where someone wants to, you know, we need to clean the bathrooms in the office, right? It's, it's a job that needs to be done. When you got that many people going there and using the restrooms, it's something that needs to be taken care of. Well, <laughs> for a while, everybody was on the list and everyone's going through it. And look, when it's my job to clean the toilet, you know what I did? I cleaned the toilet. I didn't say, well, I've got a college degree and I have had that, you know, and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Like, I didn't do that. I'll clean it. But I also brought up, I said, you know, I know I'm not getting paid the same amount of money that other people are getting paid here. I know that my work is valuable. I know that the, the work that I'm able to provide for you will probably make us more money if I'm able to do more of my work as opposed to doing this. And when, you, when I was able to bring something up in a very respectful way, because I say, hey, you want me to clean the toilets? I'll clean the toilets. I'll be, yes, sir, I'll do it. Not a problem. But I'm just bringing this up because I think maybe you'd want to have, you know, have other people cycle through that so that you could have my work being, being going completely 100% towards these other tasks. And that's, you know, it, it may be a real silly example, but it's just the concept of showing humility and being able to be under obedience and be able to do what you, what, what's required of you and not answering again and showing all good fidelity. The Bible says here that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. So in everything that you do, we are adorning, we are putting on the doctrines of the, of the Bible by living a certain way, by acting that out in our lives, by having that obedience in this, in this situation, having that type of obedience, that type of humility to be able to, to submit yourselves to that authority. Turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter... Actually, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 16. I'm going to read for you for, uh, from 1 Samuel chapter 4. So we see a lot of attributes already right off the bat for men. You know, being sober, being grave, being temperate, being able to know your Bible, to be sound in the faith. Um, and if you're a servant, then being able to obey your masters and, and fall into that role that you are in as a servant. Now, men specifically need to be strong. This is an attribute that is very um, manly, that is very masculine, that, that needs to be um, known, and we need to make sure that as men, you're, we are very strong. I'm going to read for you from 1 Samuel chapter 4, starting in verse number 8. The Bible reads, Woe unto us. This is the Philistines speaking, okay, when they're battling against Israel. 
And they got all scared and upset that the children of Israel had brought the Ark of the Covenant in. And, you know, they're all excited because at that time, the children of Israel thought the Ark, they, they thought of it more like a good luck charm, right? And, and they were not really right with God at all. And they brought the Ark of the Covenant in. So now the Philistines see this and they see the excitement and they say, Woe unto us! Who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? Of course, plural. They don't even get it that, it, that there's one Lord. These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. So they've heard about the God, you know, the, the Lord, the God of Israel. And they've heard enough to know about the Egyptians. And they get scared. They say, oh man, what are we going to do about this? And it's, they were superstitious also because this artifact was there. They think all of a sudden they're going to lose the war. Verse 9, it says, Be strong, quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent, and there was a very great slaughter for their fellow of Israel, 30,000 footmen. Now, look, I get it. This story is not, you know, this is the Philistines speaking here. This is an ungodly heathen nation using this phrase. But I'm going to show, what I'm going to show you in 1 Corinthians 16, if you're there, is that this actually, this be strong and quit yourselves like men. There's basically what they're saying is, you know, stop acting like a little girl. Act like a man. You know, be strong. Don't get all scared because of anything. Hey, we're here to war. We're here to fight. We're here to battle. Be strong and quit you like men and get up for the battle and get ready and fight. That was the attitude that they had. And this is something to men that, that should be an attribute of men to not back down and not be scared, to not cower in fear when the opposition is against you, but to be strong and, and quit you like men and get out for the fight. Because we have a spiritual battle that we have. Look at verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 16. The Bible says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. So we see here that even though, yeah, that was the Philistines talking in 1 Samuel, well, this applies to the New Testament Christian. He says, watch. You have to be vigilant. You have to know what's going on. Be aware of what's going on around you. Be aware of the wickedness. Be aware of what's going on in this world. Stand fast in the faith. Be unmovable. Don't allow anyone to shake your faith. Be grounded and founded. Again, going right in line with the other attributes that we saw for men. You need to be firm. You need to be planted. And quit you like men and be strong. We need to be strong. A strength where you're not just going to be easily pushed around and pushed over, but you're strong because you're standing. First of all, you have a foundation of a rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have any better thing to stand on than that foundation with your salvation. But not only that, you're grounded and rooted down in your faith because you've read this book, because you know this book. You have a knowledge and you understand your own doctrine and you show uncorruptness and you take things seriously and not everything's just a joke and a big game. And you can quit you like men and be strong in the face of opposition. That's why we send men out to war. That's why we should. And not just be sending women out to war because women don't have the strength that men have. Women are to be strong in their own regard. But for a battle, especially for, for a spiritual battle like this, we need to quit you like men and be strong. And unfortunately, there's too many men that have become pansies in the Christian churches around this country which have backed down and let the wickedness just abound and not say anything. And they turn tail and run and they don't want to offend anybody because it's not politically correct these days to say anything against homosexuality. Be strong. Quit you like men. Don't back down. Stand up for the word of God. So if you went to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Another attribute for men is you need to be able to work hard. And especially if you have a family, you need to work hard for your family. And in 1 Timothy chapter 5, we've, uh, we turned to this, I believe, last week, where it talks about the requirements for widows and how the church is responsible for taking care of widows unless they have family that can take care of them. So even if you're not married and have your own immediate family, there are people within your 
extended family that you still ought to be able to care for. You ought to be able to take care of, you know, maybe your grandparents. Maybe your parents don't do what their job is supposed to be, but you have grandparents and they have need. Take care of them. Okay, maybe your parents are heathen. Maybe they're unsaved. Maybe they, they live a wicked lifestyle. I don't know. Everyone's in all kinds of different situations. But this isn't only just applying to a man in his, in his own personal immediate family. When, when I'm talking about men working hard and being able to provide. Because you ought to be able to care for your own and care for your family. Especially if someone becomes a widow. But look at verse number 8 here. And this is in regards to this to widows having families and they're not taking care of them. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house. So here it's saying, for, you know, provide not for his own in a broader sense, but then especially for those of his own house, of his own immediate family. So it's saying you ought to be able to provide for your own in the broader sense, but then especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel if you're not providing and taking care of your family, if you're not looking out for your family. If you are not working and able to provide to help out your family that's in need, to your, and especially your immediate family, men, deadbeat dads that don't go out and get a job, that just sit and collect welfare on the couch, and they're barely able to get anything done for their family, get off your rear end and get out there and get a job and work hard because that's what men are supposed to do. You are worse than an infidel. You are worse than an unbeliever who's going to spend an eternity in hell. If you can't provide for your own, get up and get a job. And I've seen too many men these days that complain, oh, I've got these injuries and I've got these problems and I've got this PTSD. And I went, look, just shut up and get a job. Now, people who are just seriously hurt or maimed like where you can't do any work, I understand that. But I'm so sick of this nonsense of people just having mental problems, all these other things. Look, get a job, get over it and work hard. Get that work ethic and get to work. A lot of us have to deal with pain on a daily basis. Just suck it up and work. You're a man. Be strong. Flip over to 1 Thessalonians 2, just uh, to the left, backwards in your Bible, a few pages. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Not only men are you supposed to be able to provide for your own, provide for your family, and work hard to do that, we need to work hard for God also and be able to care for the souls at, that, that get one. So the same way that you care for your family and you work hard for them and you want to see them doing better and you want to you provide for them, when we go out and work for God, we ought to have a similar type of care and charity for the other people that we are winning to Christ. Look at verse number eight, chapter 2, verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 2 Verse number 8, the Bible reads, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica. Again, in all these epistles, these are churches that he helped start, that he was out soul winning, and he helped to get these people together and get them in the church and, and, and start a church to worship God. And he's saying, you know, when we came to you, we were not only willing to just give you the gospel, which is great anyways, in and of itself, you know, preaching the gospel to someone, hey, praise the Lord. But he said, we didn't stop there. We were also willing to impart our own souls unto you. We were pouring out our heart, our heart and our soul and working very hard to help you to succeed beyond just being saved. Verse number 9, For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preach unto you the gospel of God. They had a job where they wouldn't normally have to have to work. They could have been taken care of by churches, by you know, other people who are getting saved because they're doing this great, important work for God. But he said, nope, not only do we preach the gospel, we labored night and day. Man, it's hard work. You ought to be able to work hard at your job, but you also ought to be work and labor hard for Jesus Christ. You say, oh, but I've got a full-time job. How can I do this? 
The Apostle Paul did it. And he was helping getting churches started with a full-time job to support his needs and to not have to, to be worried about anyone else taking care of him. It can be done. I have a full-time job. I know other pastors have full-time jobs. You can do a work for God and you can find and make the time to serve God with a full-time job. It's hard. You might have to labor and work night and day and stay up real late and get up really early in the morning. But you can do it. You can serve the Lord. That's what the Apostle Paul is giving, and that's the, the example that he was setting. Look at verse number 10. Ye are witnesses in God also how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. So now he's, he's bringing up how they cared, he cared for them after their salvation, after they got saved. We can't just let the soul winning stop at the door. We have to be able to continue further as a father doth his children. The Apostle Paul, multiple times in the Bible, talks about people that he's begotten in his bonds. He's begotten through the gospel. He has brought forth children. Why? Because they got born again through the efforts of what he was doing. So are they born of God? Yes, of course they're born of God. But because the Apostle Paul was involved in that effort and that work, he was taking the liberty, which is in God's word, which is rightfully so. He was able to say these things that, hey, I've begotten, you know, he's like a father to them. And he teaches that, you know, you may have, you have many teachers in Christ, but not many fathers. You know, not many people, there's only one person that leads you to the Lord. Usually, you know, there's not many people that, that are specifically involved in you making the decision to convert and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not very many people like that. You have a lot of people teaching him. You have people all day long after you get saved that want to teach you about God. But not many people actually lead you to Christ. And he refers to himself as a father in that sense. And we need to have that type of an attitude with the souls that get saved. That's what he says. As you know how we exhorted and comforted. So exhortation, you know, building people up. Hey, man, you can come on to church. You know, come out here. We'll help you out. Comforting, right? A lot, a lot of times people get saved or going through rough times in their life and they need comforting. And charged every one of you. What's charged? I mean, just giving them a charge or a command or a directive, some type of direction in your life. He charged them, hey, come to church. Hey, fellowship with us. Congregate. Hey, learn the Bible. Come here and do these things. Get baptized. These are charges that you give to people after they get saved. Along with the exhorting and comforting, charge them. Tell them what they need to do next. Now, a lot of people get saved. They don't know what they're supposed to be doing. They just got saved. Hey, hallelujah. But what do I need to do? Now, what's the next step? Hey, come get baptized. Hey, here's a Bible. Read this. You know, start here. Start reading the Bible. Charge them. Give them, give them direction. As a father doth his children. That's what, that's what fathers do. I give my children direction. I love them. I comfort them. I try to edify them and do, you know, do all these things. This is the same type of an attitude we need to have for people that get one to Christ. Why? So that they can walk worthy of God. They just got saved. Hey, we want to teach them to be good children. Another attribute for men is to being a good leader, being able to lead people, having that, that strong leader mentality. Now, the best way to be a leader is to lead by example, to show people the right way. And in order to gain the respect of people and to be a good leader, you need to be able to lead in all seasons, in all occasions, you know, in season, out of season, no matter what's going on. You know, I think about just, you know, a simple example, maybe going out soul winning, showing your dedication, showing how serious it is, whether it's raining, whether it's hot, whether it's cold, whether it's freezing, whether you're not feeling very good, whether you're tired, still continuing to do it, still going out and being a leader and showing, hey, I really believe that this is important. I'm sincere. My heart's in this and I'm just going to do this. I'm not going to let anything stop me from doing this. Being a leader, being strong is a manly attribute, something that men need to develop and get better at because God made you to be natural leaders within the home, to be able to lead your family, to be able to lead your wife and to lead that direction. And not only that, to, you know, in, in some cases to lead in other areas. 
lead on the job, lead you know, in the government, lead wherever. There's different areas you can lead as a man that has been um, something specifically for men. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now we're going to go into an area that this is definitely specifically for men. We're going to see about, we're going to read about bishops and deacons. These are offices within the church that is specifically given unto men. And there are certain attributes. Now look, Verse number one says, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Not every man desires the office of a bishop. And that's not sinful to not want to be a bishop or a pastor. There's nothing wrong with that. But many men do. And if you desire the office of a bishop, hey, that's a good work. It's a very good work. But what we're going to be looking at as we go through these qualifications even if you never want to be a bishop or a deacon, don't just ignore this whole chapter as a result of that. Because these are qualifications that you ought to have be fulfilling anyways. These are all good things that, because who knows, maybe later on in your life you're going to decide, you know what, I do have the desire to do this. And if you can just make sure you stay qualified, because all these qualifications, I mean, these are, these are good attributes to have, and this is going to make you to be a better Christian anyways and to serve God better if you can have these attributes that it lays out here um, to be able to be qualified to even take that office of the bishop. Because what is that? That's held to a higher standard. Being the bishop of a church, you have to be able to, to meet a certain standard that God has laid out. Well, why wouldn't you want to meet that standard? Even if you never go into that, just to be able to meet the standards, say, you know what, I want to I want to be able to qualify to God's highest standards. But let's look at some of these attributes for the man that wants to have this type of an office. Verse 2: A bishop then must be blameless. This goes hand in hand with what we've already read about, you know, sound speech that cannot be condemned. You're blameless. Essentially, it's overall not, not completely perfect because nobody is. But in the eyes of other people, you know, no one's going to have any evil to say of you and to, and to be able to bring up, oh, yeah, you know, this guy's fraudulent in his business or anything like that. You're blameless. You know, you're, you're keeping everything above water. You're, you're doing things with integrity and you're, you're treating people right. The husband of one wife. Now, not everyone has to be the husband of one wife. There's some people, you know, it's not a commandment that you must get married. But in order to be a bishop, you do have to be married. You have to be the husband of one wife. Vigilant, right? You're on guard. You're able to, to look out for things, looking out for the evil, looking out for the, the, you know, wickedness. Sober, again, we've gone over that. Of good behavior, real similar to being blameless. You know, no one's able to, to say that, that you're rowdy or, you know, cause a lot of problems. Um, given to hospitality, so you're, you're very open to, to people, you know, giving people a meal or putting up your place for people to stay, you know, being hospitable and, and caring about the needs of others to, to give them what they need and being very open about that, not, not grudgingly, but sincerely. Uh, apt to teach. Very important for this job to be able to show people and, and to break down the Bible and explain what everything means in a very, very simple way. It's teaching. You're just able to show people in another way to get you to think about, to get things to click. We do this all the time out soul winning. We try to get people to understand and we bring up examples and we, we, we mention things, you know, um, to get people to understand the free gift of salvation. And that's, you know, you can start if you would say, I'm not sure if I'm apt to teach. Start with the soul wing. Start with the same thing over and over again and, and try to come up with different examples and then start applying that to uh, the Bible and other areas. But it's the same concept of, of being able to teach. Verse number three, not given to wine. If you're not a wino, you're not a drunkard. No striker, right? Not someone who gets into fights. You know, striker means to hit. So you're not someone who's just, you know, provoked and easily provoked and just you get into fights. You know, there's some guys that just, they just go out looking for trouble. There's some guys that, you know, you step on their toe and they're going to be swinging. If that's you, you, you know, and you want to be a pastor, you need to change that. And if that's you and you don't want to be a pastor, you need to change that. You ought not to be a striker that's just anything sets you off and you're just getting into fights. You need to have the temperance. Not greedy of filthy lucre. Very important for this job of being a pastor, not to be greedy, not to, to be covetous 
over getting financial wealth, over gain. Because obviously you're, you're dealing and administering the, the, the money that comes in and you're preaching a message that a lot of people aren't going to like sometimes. And if you're greedy for the money, you're going to be more in the business of tickling ears than preaching the word of God because you're not going to want the money to go away. But again, if you, even if you don't want to be a pastor, you shouldn't be greedy. You shouldn't be envious. You shouldn't be looking to, to just make a lot of money. Here's a, uh, continuing on here, verse 3, but patient not a brawler, not covetous. Verse 4, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. One of the qualifications to be a pastor is someone that's able to rule his own house. So this is showing here that in order to show that you have this attribute, you need to have children. So you need to be married, you need to be husband of one wife, and you need to have children in order to prove, in order to show that Hey, here's a man that knows how to run his house. Here's a man that has his children. When he says something, they listen. They respect him. And they can behave themselves because they're in subjection with all gravity. Gravity means seriousness. You know, and dad could have fun with his kids, but then when, it, when the seriousness comes on, when it's time to be sober, you, you know, and you flip the switch and say, okay, time to be good, and your kids listen to you, then that is the, the man that's going to be qualified to be able to pastor a church because it says here in verse 5, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Because there is a ruling going on within the church of being able to tell, things, tell people to do things and be able to lead and be able to show people what they need to do. It's, it's on a greater scale of something similar that you do within the home of leading within the home, of, of telling your kids to do things and they listen to you and um, keeping everything under control. That is an attribute that needs to be had in order to pass the church. Verse number six, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Not a, nov a novice is a beginner, someone who just, just new to this thing. Oh yeah, I don't really know. Where is this in the Bible? I don't know. You need to be able to, to be grounded and founded and not just some beginner, but someone who has put forth a lot of work and has been recognized as someone who is, um, who's done a lot of work. Verse number seven. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Look, this has already been mentioned before about being blameless and of good behavior. This is a pretty important quality to have that people can look at you in other areas, maybe on the job, maybe anywhere else, that you have a good report, that people can speak of you well and not speak of you. Oh man, that guy, yeah, he, he does this and he does that. Because then you could fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Verse 8, likewise, now this is, that was all for the bishops, for the pastors. Likewise must the deacons be grave. Same attribute, we're not going to go over that again. Not double-tongued. Right? Speaking out of both sides of your mouth. Saying one thing and doing another. Saying two different things and being contradictory. Not given to much wine. Not greedy of filthy lucre. A lot of the same attributes. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. So the Bible's saying here that all these attributes are not something that you discover later on. Oh, well, it's a good thing he fits the bill after you put someone in charge of a church. And that's one of the things that I don't really like about, you know, when churches lose a pastor and then they kind of shop around for a new pastor and these, these guys come in and it's like they bring a resume and then they like preach for a service or something and then they're gone. How do you really know that a man has, you know, his family is in subjection to him and, and some of these other attributes that you kind of have to know someone a little bit more to, to really know if they're fitting the bill. And that's why I believe that, that replacement pastors, pastors ought to be coming up from within the church. And if it's not happening within the church, you got a problem because that pastor then has not done his job in teaching others to do likewise, to do the same thing that he does. See, my goal is for all the men in this church to be able to do the same thing I'm doing, regardless of if they ever pastor a church. My goal is to get them to that level to be able to, to you know, lead, lead singing, preach sermons, you know, go out soul winning, lead soul winning, have responsibility and do everything on their own. 
because those are all great attributes to have and you can serve God better when you have all of those skills. The more skills you have, the more you can be used of God. And these types of people ought to be coming up from within the church. And when the pastor, it's time for them to, to retire or they pass away or whatever happens and they need to be replaced, then you shouldn't have to shop around. You could say, hey, the church can go, here's a guy that fits the bill. He's been here all along. Praise the Lord. We've got someone to pastor the church now. You need to have fit all these things and then you can use the office. Here it says, of a deacon being found blameless. You've already fit that bill. Verse number 11, even so must their wives be grave. Not slain. And we went over this last week. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. Again, same attribute for a deacon as for a bishop as far as the uh, ruling of their household. Verse number 13, for they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. God looks at this as a very good thing. You've earned yourself a good degree if you are, are able to use the office of a deacon well. So there's something to think about. If you're a man, you want to serve God, this is a great way to do it. This is something that is open to you if you can meet these qualifications. Now I'm going to switch gears and talking about getting married and raising children. Because yes, part of this, part of your service to God is going to be in how you decide to get married, how you, you, you hold yourself and um, run your family. This is very important because there's a specific job for men. Now I start off saying if you're not married, to, to not commit fornication. Let's start right there. You say maybe you're never going to get married. Doesn't matter. You ought to not uh, commit fornication. First Thessalonians 4 3 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. He said, You need to be able to control yourself, control your vessel, your body, the, the, the physical desires that you have. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says not to make your, the members of your body the members of a harlot and to become one flesh with them because you are housing the Spirit of God. So not to commit fornication for the, for the unmarried men. But if you want to get married, do it right. Start off marrying a believer, someone else who has the same God as you, who's also saved. The Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? So for men who are single that want to get married, make sure you're choosing yourself out a woman who is also a believer because you are yoking yourself together with a woman for the rest of your life. That is a yoke that you are putting on. Make sure that you marry a believer and also make sure that you are not marrying a divorced woman. Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, the words of Jesus Christ himself said, But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Find the right woman. Find a believer. Find someone who has not already been divorced. And find a virtuous woman who's going to be there to help you serve God and to raise godly children. This is important. Again, for men who have not been married yet, for single men that are looking to get married and you want to serve God with your life, this is something that you want to do and you want to serve Him well, make sure you invest the time in finding the right woman. You can read Proverbs 31. It goes all over all the attributes of a virtuous woman, of someone, the attributes and the things that you want to look for in a woman. But you want to have someone there who is on board with their service and your service to God to where you both want to be able to live a godly Christian life, where you want to, to put off the lusts of the flesh and you both have a goal of serving the Lord. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, turn if you would to uh, 1 Corinthians 14. In Proverbs 19, verse 13, the Bible says, A foolish son is the calamity of his father, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. So if you haven't been married, you need to be praying for a prudent wife 
because you don't want to just be constantly fighting. The word's contentions. It means fightings. So it says the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping. It means it's, it's, it's really annoying. It's a drop, like, like the, you just hear the water dropping, 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 just continuous drop, 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 and could drive you mad. That's what the Bible's saying here, that the contentions of a wife, so the fighting of a wife. So you want to you wanna try to find a wife that's not going to be um, fighting with you Hope, uh, over your service for the Lord. You know, you ought to have all the other godly attributes figured out so that you're not fighting because you're a drunk or because you're lazy and you're not, you know, supporting your family. But, um, you know, if, you're, if, if you marry someone that's contentious with you, that's not willing to, you know, fall into their godly role, hey, be aware of that, of what you're getting into. And you need to be looking for a prudent wife and praying for a prudent wife from the Lord. And you need to be able to teach your wife and your children the Bible. You need to be the spiritual head of your household. Not just the authoritative head, but the spiritual head of your household. Men, look at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34. The Bible reads, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. The Bible gave this commandment basically for the women's sake. We went over this last week that, you know, hey, women, it's not permitted for you to speak. You need to be able to learn. And if you want to learn anything, you need to ask questions. Ask your husband at home. Husbands, take this to heart because it is expected of you to then be able to answer your wife. So if your wife has a question and she wants to learn something, you are going to be holding her back from serving God when you don't know the answer, when you are not there to be able to teach your wife what is right and true from the Bible. You know what that means? You better be studying more than your wife is. You better make sure you are getting in the Word more than your wife is. That's one of your jobs because you need to be able to answer her questions. So hopefully you have a godly wife and she's reading the Bible every day. Guess what? You need to be reading more. You better make sure you're staying one step ahead at least. One step ahead and just and being there to fill your role as the husband, as the man in that household. Amen. And that is a serious responsibility. I'm, you know, I'm not even joking when I say that. That that is a serious responsibility to make sure that you can have the answers. That you can be the spiritual head and that you can guide and lead your wife. And if we were going to apply this then to the next level of maybe becoming a pastor or a bishop, you better know the Bible more than your congregation does. You know, if people in your congregation just keep coming up to the pastor, oh, I don't know, oh, I don't have an answer to that. There's something wrong with that pastor. You ought to be able to know the Bible enough to be able to provide an answer the same, in the same regard, you know, on a smaller scale. The husband needs to be able to do that for their wife. You need to be able to be there to give, to give answers. Now, I know not any one person knows absolutely everything. But it should not be a habit where you just continually don't know answers to questions. Okay? Everybody's going to find something. And I'll be the first one to admit when I just don't understand something from the Bible. You know, it's not a requirement to know everything in the Bible before you can, you know, be an authority figure, before you can pass a church. But... You do need to have knowledge, you know, and for, for the pastor, you can't be a novice. And for a husband, you need to be there for them to be able to ask you questions to teach them. Ephesians chapter 5. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. The Bible reads, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. This is written in the Bible as a commandment for us to do. So if you want to serve Christ and you have a wife, if you're a husband, love your wife. And not just love her, but love her with the love that Christ had for the church. Because Christ gave his own body. He gave up himself. He had a selfless love for the church, for, for people to get saved. We need to have that type of a love for our wives. Where you are willing to endure whatever it is that you have to endure in order to help your wife. And help her. Look at what it says. Now, this... <laughs> Not every wife is going to like 
what it says here, but look at the way that the Bible likened the, the, um, the love that we should have for our wives and to be able to give yourself for it. And that's great. And yes, amen. But look at the way that it kind of applies this with the way that, that Christ had to love for the church in verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church. So Christ did all of this for the church so that he could present it, uh, a bride for himself that is glorious. It says, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that should be holy and without blemish. So no blemishes, no, no, no bad marks. And a husband ought to love his wife enough to help her to get to a more spiritual life where there's no blemishes and, no, you know, and, 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 and problems there and, and glaring problems that we need to be able to um, love our wives enough to invest time in them and to help them to also grow and, and to, um, you know, be here without spot, without blemish. It says, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Now, also, I know that the man, the husband is in charge and has the authority. But when we're looking at the way that Christ gave himself, for his church to, to, to grow. We ought to look to his example in the way that he led in order to help our wives also to grow and, and you know, become without blemish. So it's not, Christ didn't rule with the heavy handed, you know, you must do this, you know, like, like what, whatever it is that you're trying to help your wife with. He didn't have that heavy hand. But there's encouragement. There's a lot of words Christ used, you know, to, to, to give them, you know, to, to, to have freedom to do things, right? But um, teaching and admonishing um, in, in, a, in a loving way. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Because that's loving your wife and being able to, to teach your wife. But we need to be able to teach our children also as fathers. No, I believe the majority of, of teaching that goes on in general in the household is going to be from the mother to child because the, the, the husband's going to be off working and the, and the mother's going to be raising the children and raising means teaching and training. But it does not say, you know, that does not absolve teaching from the father. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 6. The Bible reads, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. So you need to know the words of God. You need to keep them in your heart. These words should be in your heart. Verse 7, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. One, having that type of a love and dedication to God's word, and just, just basically have it a major part of your life. It's all over the place. It's in your house. It's in front of your eyes all the time. You're talking about it with your children and teaching them diligently. When you're going on the car ride, when you're, when you're walking around, when you're doing different things, when you wake up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, you're talking about the Word of God. And you're teaching diligently. You're, you're making sure, you know what, I need to make sure. I need to make sure that my kids know about God. I need to make sure they learn the right things. I need to make sure they're learning the truths from the Bible. And you're diligent about it. And that is a responsibility that ultimately the buck stops with you, Dad. You can say, well, my wife's not doing her job of teaching. Well, the buck stops with you. You're the leader. If she's not doing her role, you've got to figure out a better way to lead then. Because ultimately, you are going to be, have that responsibility. You can't just pawn everything off. Now, ladies, just because I said that doesn't mean, yeah, it's my husband's fault. You, know, you, get, you get yourself in line, in, in, in line with what God has for you to do. But husbands, you, know, you are there to be a leader. And a good leader will make it easier 
for people, for, for your wife to, to follow, or for anyone to follow. A good leader, will have, well, it's easy for people to follow a person like that because they are showing the way, they are serving, they're doing a lot of other things um, besides just being in charge. Last place we'll turn, Matthew chapter 6. The last thing I want to just emphasize here before we're done talking about the men and serving God. Matthew chapter 6, because we've talked over and over again how important it is for men to work hard. We've talked about how you need to provide for your family. You need to make sure their needs are met. You need to do all these things. You need to work really hard. Work hard to study. Make sure you're, you're you know, you're, and think about all the things that you're in charge of. Hey, you need to be a good leader for your wife. You're going to be leading by example, right? You need to make sure you're teaching your kids. You need to make sure you're working and earning enough. You need to make sure you stay ahead of your wife's learning of the Bible so that you can answer her questions. That's a lot of work for you to do, man. You might have to lose a little sleep over in order to accomplish all these things. You know, women say, oh man, if I were just in charge, well, you'd have all these responsibilities then. It's a, it's a big task to be a good, godly, righteous man in serving him the way that he has laid out for you to do. That's why you need to be grave. You take it seriously. I mean, life's not a joke. Live, live your life. Though, you know, God has you here for a reason. You have children. Their souls are all so important. So important. The parents, you need to be realizing that every single day and, and making sure that we're investing the time that we need in them. Husbands, your wives are important. Invest the time. Matthew chapter 6, look at verse number 31. With all the work that we need to do, and especially when we're struggling to make sure that, our, that a family needs are met, make sure, you better make dead sure that their needs are met. But also make sure that we don't take that too far to where, okay, the needs are met, but now you're starting to just accumulate and you're focused too much on working really hard and making money. It started off maybe for the right reasons of making sure that our needs are met, our health needs are met, you know, our food needs are met, that we're, I mean, I'm getting this, you know, I'm, I'm working hard enough to be able to provide. And then you get so caught up in that work mode where you start working more and you're earning more money, you're earning more money, and you're focusing still a vast majority of your time. Now your needs have already been met and now you're getting more comfortable and, and you still stay on this one track of earning money. The Bible says in verse 31 of Matthew 6, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things, but seek ye first... The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Have the faith to trust in God and to know that one way or another he'll provide. And try not to get too stressed out about it. Hey, if you're living a righteous life, if you are seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, if you are putting that as the priority in your life, of saying, God, I want to serve you and I'm, I'm doing what I can to help you, God. I have mouths to feed. I've got a lot and I only get paid this much and I'm not getting any raises. And God, God knows. And he's telling us this because he's saying, you don't even have to stress about it. And I take care of the birds. You think I'm not going to take care of you? Don't worry about that. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. But I've got all these bills coming due tomorrow. If you're working, if you're doing what's right, if you're doing what God's laid out for you, don't have to worry about it. He'll take care of you. One way or another. And again, you know, people like to take that the whole opposite direction, the other extreme, and just sit on the couch and go, God's going to take care of me. No. You're doing what God tells you to do. You're working hard. You're providing for your family. And you are seeking first, above all those things, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God will provide. He always does. He's true to his word. We could, we could trust Jesus' words here in Matthew chapter 6. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. Lord, I pray that you would please help this church to be able to teach and to train up godly women, godly men, godly children, dear Lord. Help us all to learn our roles. Help us all to serve you more, dear God. Help us to get that extra knowledge. And once we have the knowledge to apply it, dear Lord, help us to work harder as men. Help us to be able to, to love our wives uh, appropriately and to be able to give ourselves for them, dear God. God, help us 
to, um, to be strong leaders, not to be pushed around, to be able to, to quit ourselves like men, dear Lord, and to stand up and to be ready for the spiritual fight. Help us to gain the knowledge that we need and that we wouldn't be weary and well-doing, dear Lord, but that we can just continually serve you and that you would strengthen us, dear God. Strengthen us tonight and help us to be, to, to be able to, to raise up some kind of, of revival here of young men that are willing to serve you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.